Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Welcome. Thanks for joining today's session. We'll just wait a few more seconds for, for the rest of the folks to join us. Okay, I think we can uh, go ahead and get started. Um, so welcome to today's talk. Uh, my name is Ryan Zizzo. I'll be giving a presentation on low, <clears throat> low carbon materials and bodied carbon in construction. <clears throat> so for my talk today, I'm gonna give you a quick introduction to uh, Mantle Developments, my, my company and, and what we do. Um, although I'll, I'll then get into Embodied Carbon 101, a quick overview of what we mean by Embodied Carbon and why it's important and where it comes from. Um, we'll then talk about some regulation that is developing in the industry and how this is moving from a, a voluntary um, best practice into a, a standard requirement for construction um, in the future. And we will then look at what we can do to reduce embodied carbon. And I will go through a case study with, with everyone. Uh, we'll have some time for hopefully for questions and answers um, at the end. So just a quick intro to uh, Mantle Developments. Um, we're a, a nine person consulting company with uh, six folks in Toronto, three in Vancouver. Um, we help our projects um, which are in the in the construction sector move beyond um, energy efficiency and go towards full net zero carbon um, on projects. So we like to look at the total life cycle impacts of, of a project, including materials and, and even look into um, resilience strategies so that projects that we help um, can can make sure that they're future proof, um, net zero and climate resilient. I am a professional engineer with uh, over 15 years of experience. I worked with um, a large uh, engineering firm called Halswell Associates, which is now part of WSP uh, for the first eight years of my career doing lead certifications across, uh, across Canada. I then moved to Helsinki, Finland for three years and um, saw the Nordic green building sector, which was um, significantly more advanced than, than North America's. And that's where I got into, you know, what I consider to be next next generation sustainability and green building practices like embodied carbon and, and resilience strategies. Um, I've done quite a bit of lecturing on these topics, both in Finland and um, in Canada. I'm, I'm teaching an annual course at uh, the Toronto Metropolitan University on life cycle assessment. Um, and I've worked on a number of major um, embodied carbon projects with uh, various governments across Canada, uh, most recently with the City of Toronto helping develop new requirements for the Toronto Green Standard, um, which is something I'll talk about a little bit later. So embodied carbon 101, uh, what are we talking about when we say embodied carbon? Um, I like to start with a few key terms because there are some there can be some confusion among some of these terms. So I want to just start off by, by clarifying what some of these key terms um, mean. So you might hear people refer to life cycle assessment or LCA. This is a method of assessing the environmental impacts associated with all stages of a product or a building's life. Um, so we're talking about, you know, raw material extraction, manufacture, um, transportation, distribution, repair, maintenance, end of life disposal. Looking at the Im impacts from all of those stages together, that's what we mean when we say life cycle assessment. So this is a method, it's an approach um, to, to assess environmental impacts. Embodied carbon is one of the outputs of a life cycle assessment. So it's a metric that we would, that we would measure through life cycle assessment. Um, <clears throat> embodied carbon is typically uh, expressed in, in the, in the um, units of um, global warming potential within CO2 equivalents. So um, if the embodied carbon is, a, is an output from our LCA and it's, and it's referred to as the GWP, global warming potential, measured in CO2. Um, Operational carbon is um, and is is typically the carbon in, the carbon um, output from the energy use of a building. So embodied carbon and operational carbon together are are the whole life carbon impact of a, of a project. But currently, um, most projects have only really been focusing on their operational carbon until now through their energy efficiency measures. But they've kind of been um, ignoring or, or not really aware of their embodied carbon. So we're now bringing that embodied carbon into the picture and making sure that we're holistically managing both embodied and operating carbon. 
And then finally, an environmental product declaration or an EPD is, um, a, is a report typically created by a manufacturer of a, of a building product material like a concrete manufacturer or a glazing manufacturer, they can uh, they can hire a consultant to do a life cycle assessment on their, you know, on their supply chain, on their pr production and calculate their embodied carbon. And then they would report that through a report called an EPD, which is something that designers and architects can start asking manufacturers for and use that as a way to compare the uh, relative uh, carbon impact of the different materials used on a project or different materials under consideration for use on a project and ideally find a lower carbon product. So this picture just gives a bit more of a, a breakdown of, of those different life cycle stages that we talk about um, in terms of where the carbon of a construction project comes from. You can see the, the, the yellow section of the drawing here is the operational carbon, um, operational emissions, which is, um, as, as, as I mentioned before, from the energy use of a building, the annual energy we use to heat, cool, light, ventilate our buildings. That's um, what we've been managing until now, uh, up until now, typically through things like the building code and um, energy modeling, that's all related to operational carbon. And we've been doing a really good job of managing and, and minimizing that over the past few um, decades, but it's not the entire carbon picture of our built environment. <clears throat> you can see everything else on this picture um, in blue um, is not included in our energy efficiency numbers or our operational carbon. Everything in blue is what we would call the embodied carbon. And, and, and as mentioned before, that that is all of the processes and all of the all of the materials and, and um, processes and activities associated with uh, with with mining, uh, you know, raw materials with transportation of those materials, with any manufacturing processes or installation processes at a construction site, um, even with the use phase of, of a building um, in terms of material use. So things like replacement of windows or replacement of roofs, or even you know, maintenance um, uh, associated with the project. Um, none of that, you know, none of that material impacts through the use phase would be included in operational energy bills. So that's all part of embodied carbon. And then even end of life, um, such as demolition, disassembly, recycling, um, and end of life um, landfill processes, anything like that. So all of those together is embodied carbon. <laughs> um, we can put those into these buckets of, of, of life, different life cycle phases, and um, there's international standards that kind of uh, provide some guidance and, and some consistency to this so that we can um, know what we're measuring and, and how to compare that against other projects. So um, those, those are broken up into the product phase, which is everything from the start of man, uh, raw material extraction up until um, up until um, something leaves the manufacturer. The construction phase is transportation to the site and the construction itself, and that ends right before uh, the building becomes occupied. The use phase is the entire occupied time of the building, and then the end of life phase. And all of these emissions are pretty much across the board have been overlooked and not managed or or minimized um, until very recently on 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 you know some best practices like lead or other um other um programs or, or third-party systems have started to require this embodied carbon management so there are a few you know a few projects are starting to look at this but i would say it's the a minimum uh, uh, you know maybe five percent of the market is starting to look at embodied emissions it's very much not um a standard um a standard practice right now, but that is changing rapidly and we are seeing a lot of regulation coming in that will be accelerating um, embodied carbon management in the future, which we'll talk about. So the international standards break up those big those big buckets of life cycle um, or those big phases into these um, sub phases. And you'll see that the nomenclature here A1 to A5 um, associated with the, all the product and construction phases. B1 to B5 for the use phase, um, and then even B6 and B7 are operational energy use and operational water use. Those are not included in embodied carbon. You'll see you see the green line here um, 
it, it, it does not include those those issues, those um, areas of B6 and B7. And then end of life is, is the C phase. So you might see people reporting in body carbon or life cycle results um, using these numbers. Sometimes people will say this, these are our e, A1 to A3 results or our A1 to A5 results or you know A1 to C4 results. So those numbers, that's what they're referring to here. It's, it's, which, life cycle, it's which life cycle phases are being included in the results. Um, I'll just point out that the A1 to A5 is a subset here what it, that's called upfront carbon. So this is all the carbon that happens before occupancy. And we're starting to see a movement where this is where people are really focusing on the upfront carbon. And there's a few reasons for that. Um, one of them is that it's typically the largest uh, source of embodied carbon. Um, recent studies have shown it's anywhere from 75% to even up to 90% of all the embodied carbon happens in this upfront phase. Um, there's some other pulses of embodied carbon throughout the use phase. This is, you know, replacement of windows and doors and roofs and things like that, that, that we touched upon before. And then finally, another excuse me, another pulse at the end um, associated with disassembly, but those are minor pulses. Um, it is the, the vast majority that happens upfront. The other reasons why people are focusing on upfront is because um, we need to make big <laughs> emissions reductions in the short term. So, you know, the the other those other future pulses of embodied carbon happen, you know, decades down the down the line when we're talking about a major you know building project that has you know a sixty to one hundred year life lifespan. So, um, we really want to focus on the short term emission reductions. Um, and then finally, the embodied carbon. Uh, the upfront embodied carbon is, you know, is is all a result of the, the procurement and design decisions that we're making right now. So we should be able to manage that and uh, minimize that because these are all real emissions that are happening, you know, in the in the now, as opposed to the, those future emissions that will rely on assumptions of future technologies and future um, methods that we don't really have clarity around. There's a lot of assumptions that need to go into those future life cycle. Um, future embodied carbon emissions. So those are the reasons why people are really focusing more so on the upfront carbon for reduction. Um, and this slide I like to, to share, which really shows why this is becoming um, so important and, and, and becoming increasingly important in body carbon. It you know, wasn't really on the radar a few years ago, but this explains why it's becoming more of an issue now than, than ever before. So the top part of the slide is what I would call the, the embodied or the carbon um, breakdown of a building um, of the past, where in year one, 100% um, of the emissions was from embodied when we're, we built, you know, we procured and built the building. And then every year we're getting a little bit more carbon in the atmosphere due to operating the building, right? As we do, as we heat, cool, light, the building from the energy use. And by the end of the lifespan of the building, say around 60 years, we would see a significantly higher amount of operating carbon in the atmosphere from this building than embodied carbon. Um, so that's what buildings of the past used to look like. But because we've been doing um, a really good job at making our new buildings more energy efficient, um, and because our energy system is even is becoming lower carbon, as as everyone I think on the call knows, we've you know phased out uh, coal in Ontario. We're adding uh, solar farms and wind farms across the province. So because of that, a, a unit of energy today is much lower carbon than it used to be, if like even a decade ago. So when we pair the fact that new buildings are using less energy and the energy they're using is lower carbon, and we add those things together, we're seeing a significant change in the carbon footprint of, or, or in the relative uh, impact of embodied versus operating carbon from new construction. So now we're closer to the bottom of the screen where operating carbon today over the whole life of a, of a building from from new construction is not vastly larger than embodied carbon it's it's on you know the same order of magnitude and if things get really interesting when we start thinking about low uh, about um, shorter time frames so look at what happens when we just focus on the first 10 years of a building you can see here that the embodied carbon is actually the vast majority of the carbon footprint under this new reality of high efficiency buildings and, and low carbon um, energy system so you can see this is actually the complete opposite that in the past we might it might make sense to kind of ignore embodied carbon and just focus on operating carbon and that's kind of what we were doing in the past but with this new reality it's the opposite we really need to be laser focused on embodied carbon 
um, and, and not, I don't think we need to put as much emphasis on reducing operating carbon in the short term. And again, this is just for new construction. For old buildings that, you know, were built under old, old codes, it, the primary focus should be reducing their energy. Um, but for new construction, we should be focusing on embodied carbon or doing, you know, obviously we still want to make sure they're energy efficient, but we don't, we want to be pairing that with embodied carbon reductions. So that last slide was, you know, illustrative in nature and showed the general trend. This is um, an actual data from from a project that we calculated the embodied carbon on for the uh, for the provincial government. This is a, a LEED certified um, institutional building, um, and we showed the, you know, the relative split between operating carbon versus um, embodied carbon. This was based on uh, two years of, of real data of operating the building. So we just extrapolated what whatever they used in the first two years. We just said that's the same amount that they're going to be using annually. And we ex extrapolated that out over 60 years and then calculated the embodied carbon of the project in blue. And you can see that over the first 12 years, for example, um, in the short term, um, the operating, uh, sorry, the embodied carbon vastly outweighed the operating carbon. Um, another really interesting finding here was the, the dotted uh, red line here. That's the embodied carbon just from the concrete. So, you know, we, we see here like one material has a has a huge um, has a huge amount of carbon in it. Looks like it's it's even you know there's more carbon in the concrete than 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 there is over 12 years of operating the building. So you know the met metrics like that really is eye opening to a lot of people, and they really had no idea that you know the our, the carbon footprint of one material is is more than a decade of, of of the energy use of a building, and we're not having any discussions around how to how to minimize that carbon in the in the concrete. So this is really helping to shift the conversation, seeing numbers like this to to see where we should be spending our time and effort and money to try to reduce our carbon most effectively. Um, is we probably should be talking to our concrete supplier. Um, so I want to just quickly mention mass timber as a new and innovative um, approach that we're starting to see gain market traction. Um, this is a new building um, under that that's under construction right now in in uh, the waterfront in Toronto uh, along along Queens Key and near Sherburn Street. This was a couple months ago. I took the photo. You can see there was snow on the ground here. So, uh, but now the building is is almost fully. I think it is actually topped out, and they're just doing the putting up the cladding right now. But you can see the main um, the, the the ground floor and the and the um, elevator and, and stair core is concrete, but the rest of the floors are all built with this mass timber structure. Um, we calculated the embodied carbon associated with this project and compared it against um, a traditional all concrete design and found that there was about a third reduction in the embodied carbon of the project by by using this mass timber. Um, and in this this image here, we showed the total carbon footprint of, of that decision. Um, a, a typical con all concrete building would, would be around 600 of uh, this, this unit's kilograms of CO2 per meter squared, because this is an intensity value. value. Um, but if we if we compare concrete at 600 to the actual mass timber building was around 380. And these other lines here were the different um, energy efficiency of the mechanical systems that were under uh, that were under consideration for the design. And, you know, there was four different um, tiers of, of uh, efficiency in the mechanical systems under consideration. And the interesting thing that we found here was that um, when we when we change the starting point uh, based on the embodied carbon from going to concrete to, to mass timber, we found that the least efficient mass timber design, so the dotted orange line, was less carbon than the um, than the most efficient concrete design, right? So, so this is just showing that material the materials matter, right? Mat the material that we use has a bigger carbon impact than the mechanical system uh, efficiency over over those shorter time frames. So we presented these results to uh, Waterfront Toronto, and they were they were quite sh shocked and interested to find this again because there's a whole you know they have a whole book around rules and regulations around you know trying to have really efficient mechanical systems, and at the time they had really no no guidance or requirements around low carbon materials, and this showed them that 
you know, there's a, there's, uh, there's more to be, you know, there's more bang for your buck in terms of more we can reduce if, if we can focus on both of those things together. And we're leaving a lot of, you know, a lot of reductions on the table that we're not achieving if we're not discussing the carbon impact of our materials. Um, so I just have a few more slides here about recent mass timber projects that are either under construction or um, under design um, across across Ontario with some um, these slides are in regards to higher education. So this is Centennial College is building out this new mass timber building um, at the University of Toronto. They have this design for for this mass timber tower here that the black part of the building is an existing existing structure, but they're going to add on this uh, mass timber tower right at Varsity Field. Um, this one, uh, Limber Lost Place, is, is George Brown College down by the by the waterfront, actually just around the corner from the uh, the last picture I showed of the or the the, the previous project um, on Queens Key as well. And we're seeing a lot more mass timber acro across the board, not just in, in higher education. Um, in terms of regulation, we we've seen mass uh, sorry we've seen embodied carbon management um, be introduced in uh, best practice uh, um, voluntary standards such as LEED or the Canada Green Building Council's uh, zero carbon building standard. Um, version four of LEED, which is the, the, the newer, most recent version, was the first one to actually um, have credits associated with whole building life cycle assessment. So even leading thing, even you know, leading things like LEED, um, it was not on their, it was not part of their list of of, of um, measures um, up until just a few years ago. So this is, as I said, quite new in the industry. Um, and both both uh, both these lead and zero carbon kind of started off with just having people measure the embodied carbon, but not really requiring a reduction per se, just to like have people start under start understanding this and start monitoring it kind of. And now we're seeing a shift into, you know, measuring it is no longer really enough to get points under these systems, but you really do have to show that you reduced it in some way. Um, we are seeing, um, you know, we are seeing also a shift from that, you know, best practice, voluntary standard um, into these regulations in, in some leading Canadian municipalities. Um, in Vancouver, this has actually been a requirement for any rezoning project since 2019. So it's so it's already been a few years that projects have had to calculate their embodied carbon. Um, again, it was just the calculation part that was required, not, not reductions um, in the past. But Council has just passed a new regulation that um, as of 2025, um, projects are going to require to show a 10% reduction um, or a 20% reduction for any wood-based buildings. And that's going to be a requirement that you need to do to get your building permit. Um, in Toronto, we have the Toronto Green Standard version 4, um, which was just released in May of this year, so just a couple months ago. And it is the first one to now require all new city-owned construction projects to calculate and disclose the embodied carbon. Um, and we are seeing um, the tier two and tier three, which are optional, you know, voluntary higher levels of performance for, for um, private buildings, non-city owned construction. Those now have reduction targets um, associated with them. Um, we are actually, Mantle is actually drafting up some updates to those requirements um, that council will be looking at next year. So um, next year, we may see an update to, to V4. It's, um, I think V5 comes out in 2025. So we're, we're looking at some updates to the, to the V4 uh, requirements even before V5 comes out. Um, so that will probably um, tighten up the re requirements a little bit and, and, and may require um, a performance cap on all, all construction. Instead of just measuring and reporting at, at a tier two, we might have uh, new regulations that are saying to get a building permit, you need to be below a certain level of embodied carbon. And then in Edmonton, they're doing a similar thing um, where city owned construction needs to start um, calculating and disclosing embodied carbon. Um, here is just a, a screenshot from the, the current Toronto Green Standard. Um, you can see here it's uh, the requirements are only around Tier 2 and Tier 3, which are the higher voluntary levels. Tier 1 is the mandatory, and there's nothing for Tier 1 currently. But there is this note at the bottom that just says the city is involved in some studies that are you know, looking into this issue. 
uh, results of the studies may refine and replace the above targets. So, so this is what we're working on right now is trying to give a little bit of a refinement to this and, and maybe a refresh on these targets uh, be before the next update of the standard. So to inform that, we, we actually just finalized um, a benchmarking pro project across Ontario where we asked for all the um, embodied carbon results, um, whole building embodied carbon results for what's called part three buildings um, as, uh, as defined by the building code, which is which is largest, larger commercial scale buildings. So this isn't um, single family homes, but it's, it's larger scale, scale construction. And we received 41 building, 41 results of results from 41 projects, and we categorized them based on the different building types. So multi-unit res that was less than four stories, um, and then res that's above five stories, and then also commercial office and all other types. And we showed the range of results that we, um, that we saw um, when we did that benchmarking. So this is the first time where we actually saw, you know, what range we're seeing in the market, and this can help inform policy decisions about, you know, what an appropriate cap might be on, on this embodied carbon to, to put into new codes and standards. Um, I should say these are self-reported results from, from teams, and we found that, you know, everyone kind of did their assessment a little bit different. They may have included a slightly different life cycle phases or different, uh, done the assessment at different um design maturity so there's some noise in these results but um, it is you know the best the best available data currently but going forward we want to see more consistency in how these assessments are performed to make sure people are you know using the same types of data using doing it at the same uh, phase of design you know the same maturity of design um, including all the same life cycle phases and including the same uh, materials and, and building systems so for example you know looking at the envelope and structure but not including interior um, furniture or site works or excavation. So there's some rules um, around what should be included and what shouldn't be included that have, were recently um, released by the National Research Council that we're hoping will give a little bit more consistency to these types of assessments in the future. Um, we are seeing new regulate or new um, <laughs> new movement around this and I guess regulation will be coming out of this from the government of Canada federally. Um, this is uh, the mandate letter for um, the environment minister or sorry the minister of natural resources last year um, which included language to introduce a new buy clean strategy to support and prioritize the use of made in Canada low carbon products and infrastructure projects. Um, buy clean is a very is a very specific term that it's it, it refers to uh, an approach that is very popular in the U.S where they um where government projects government infrastructure and building projects will um will require the use of materials that are below a carbon a certain carbon threshold so there's quite a lot of um, experience with bike clean in the us bike clean california has been in place for a few years now various other states are into introducing bike clean regulations as is the federal government in the us so we're starting to see the federal government in canada following the same uh, the same direction um, we also have something called the Greening Government Strategy in, in Canada at the federal level that has requirements around materials. So this is this this strategy is applicable to all Canadian Government of Canada construction projects, um, for government offices, um, government government owned infrastructure. Um, and they have a few key requirements around um, embodied carbon of construction. So they, they're saying that all embodied carbon needs, of structural materials needs to be disclosed as of this year, as of 2022. And they are setting a target for a 30% reduction in the embodied carbon of these materials by 2025. And to have life cycle assessments done on all major projects by 2025 as well. Um, similarly, in the U.S., we're, we're seeing uh, similar types of movements at the federal level there. Um, in end of 2021, via executive Biden ordered uh, the U.S. General Services Administration, the GSA, which is effectively the, the landlord and developer for the federal government in the U.S., um, required them to just start disclosing embodied carbon of all building materials um, as, of, as of this year. So again, you know, this is all very much new. This is all, you know, all of these regulations and approaches are I've just been coming out in the, in the past few months. So we're kind of at a tipping point where this has moved from some, some projects are doing it voluntarily in the past few years to this is moving into a requirement in, in a lot of uh, jurisdictions. 
There's also lots of other examples. We don't have time to go into them all right now, but um, if anyone wants to dig into these, I would recommend to check out um, an, or an organization called the Carbon Leadership Forum, the CLF. Um, they have a, a policy um, website that where you can, there's a map that shows all the different regions that uh, have embodied carbon policies and you can kind of click on them each and see um, what, what their approach is. And there's examples across the US at the state level. Um, there's many examples in Europe as well, including London, France, Norway, um, and, and others. Um, and just wanted to share this, this um, little story about a project in London, UK. This, uh, what they call the tulip here on the right side of the picture, um, was a proposed um, observation tower that, you know, by, by a famous architecture firm, Foster and Partners. And it was rejected by city council in London. They said um, it was not appropriate to build something with such a high embodied carbon impact that was uh, providing, you know, just views for, for people. It wasn't, it wasn't, they didn't see the payoff in terms of carbon emitted because of all the materials used. Didn't seem like it was a, as a, it was a needed piece of infrastructure. Um, and that is just interesting because this is one of the first examples where um, embodied carbon was specifically cited as a reason why a project shouldn't be approved. <clears throat> so it should be on developers' radars and owners' radars to have a, you know, have a, robust strategy to reduce your body carbon and make sure that we're being carbon efficient with our designs um, because we might you know we might not get approved because if we ignore it like like this example um, I'll give a couple examples of how we might reduce embodied carbon now. Um, so one of the things that we want to ask for is an EPD, as, as, as I mentioned in the introduction. This is a, a label that manufacturers provide to show the impact of the carbon impact and environmental impact of their products. Um, it's easy to think about, uh, about, about it as kind of an example is an, a nutrition label. When we go into a store and buy some food, you know, we can look at the nutrition label and understand exactly what the impacts of this food would be on our body if we were to eat it. That's the same idea with an EPD, but um, the impact, the environmental impacts on the environment from um, purchase, from manufacturing of the material. And the point is to have this prop, have this EPD, understand the carbon impact of our material and maybe compare it against another supplier and try to pick the one that has uh, lower carbon, for example. Um, something to, to be aware of is there are different types of EPDs or different you know, scopes or scales of an EPD. So some EPDs are a national average. Um, and the first example here on the screen you can see is an industry, it says industry average national at the bottom. And that's a, that's a ready mix concrete EPD for, made by the Canadian Ready Mix Concrete Association. So they have members across Canada. They looked at the carbon footprint of the of the products being manufactured at various plants across Canada and kind of averaged them out based on uh, volume in the different provinces. And this gave an overview of an average uh, average Canadian ready mix concrete. Um, the one in the middle here, this was just recently published just a couple of weeks ago. It's a brand, brand new um, resource. It's the first Ontario specific um, industry average EPD for ready mix concrete. Um, and then on the far right, is what we call a facility specific EPD. So this is one specific plant. Um, so you can see all three of these EPDs are Canadian concrete, but on the, on the left, that's an average for all of Canada. In the middle, that's kind of an average for all of Ontario. And then on the far right, that's one specific concrete plant. So the facility specific is really the one that we want to use um, whenever we can, if, if, if we have facility specific EPDs for the actual facilities that we're ordering our, our concrete from, for example. Um, if you don't have a facility specific EPD or if your manufacturer that you're actually ordering from doesn't have that, then I would recommend using the Ontario average one um, because that's you know more applicable to an Ontario construction project than the Canadian average one would be. But ideally, we want to start using in the future as many facility specific EPDs as, as we can. So we should be asking all of our manufacturers to provide these EPDs in the future. So some um, ways to reduce embodied carbon. Um, so one is just ask your suppliers for low carbon options. Um, this hasn't been something that uh, you know, has been on the radar of a lot of um, procurement agents or owners or um, uh, you know, people setting rules around construction. So 
we don't need to have super detailed, you know, number like specific caps or, or metrics um, if, if, if we're not that advanced in our understanding or our data right now. The first thing is just ask for a low carbon option. And often the manufacturers do have ways to deliver that, but they need to be told that, you know, that's being valued on a project. Um, in terms of specific strategies for concrete, there are a few um, easy changes we can make to our design or to our procurement of, of uh, concrete. One is to allow for longer curing time. So um, the standard um, time to hit a concrete strength is 28 days, but we can ask for longer, we can allow the concrete to build up its strength over longer periods, like 56 days or, you know, 90 days or 120 days. And the longer we allow that concrete to cure for or to gather its strength over, the, the lower carbon footprint it requires. Because um, we need to add more cement into the mix to to, uh, to make it uh, cure faster. So if we allow it to cure longer, that means we can use less cement, and cement is is the is is the high carbon piece of, of a concrete mix. So um, a lot of people they say, well, that's going to make my construction times go longer, but that's not 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 necessarily the case if we just are thoughtful about which elements we allow for longer curing times. So only elements that require quick uh, curing or early strength like suspended slabs or beams we should still use low 28 day strength but other things like slab on grades or um, walls or footings they don't require their full strength at 28 days so we can if we are thoughtful about which elements we allow to cure longer we can greatly reduce our carbon footprint without really impacting schedule or cost just by having a few conversations to optimize that with our suppliers also, we can ask for Portland limestone cement, which is a different type of cement. It has a 10% reduction in its embodied carbon, and it has the same cost, and um, it's readily available across Canada. It's been approved by all regulate, regulator, regulators in Canada. So this is kind of one of those things that it's a no-brainer. Just use a different cement. It has 10% less, less um, embodied carbon without any impacts on the project. And we can also maximize our SCMs uh, to use more supplementary um, SCMs. Um, in terms of steel, we want to ask for North American steel that has high recycled content, ideally made from low carbon um, furnaces. Uh, so really, we want to ask for the EPDs from our, from our steel manufacturers and compare it against other options that we have and try to find the one that has the lowest um, carbon production method. Um, for wood, we want to ask for certified wood. That, me that makes sure that we are um, using wood from a forest that is responsibly managed, meaning there's, you know, replanting going on, that it's not taking out um, old growth forests, that it's not clear cutting. Um, so having a certified wood means that there's proper management of the total carbon um, cycle of the forest. And then finally, we can ask for low carbon um, construction sites. So things like electric vehicles or more biofuels or electric um, construction equipment that will help reduce the carbon um, impact of the construction itself. So just a few more slides here um, to quickly go through an anonymous case study. Um, the process here was that the construction team provided some quantities for us. Uh, the material quantities we did it as we did a LCA and helped them show some uh, lower carbon options that they can um, use going forward. And these are the types of results that we provide to show them the life cycle impact of the different phases. So the vast majority of the carbon impact was from the material production itself, the A1 to A3. We found that the, the, the results were extremely low on this project because they did a few things really right on this project. One was they used mass timber as their main structural component not concrete. Two was they avoided underground construction. Um, underground construction typically has a lot higher carbon than above ground construction because there's a lot more materials needed. There is, um, you know, retaining walls. It's typically concrete. So the fact that we just don't have a basement um, and have everything above ground actually reduced the carbon quite a bit. Um, three is they did use low carbon concrete. And then fourth was they had very low use of XPS insulation, which is the highest embodied carbon insulation. So those are some good strategies that teams can try to emulate to have really low embodied carbon. Um, this is just showing some different ways that we would present these results. We can show, you know, the materials that that, that are the top um, contributing materials for where this embodied carbon is. We can do that in a table form or in a image form. You know, so this is something that's useful for project teams to consider. And then we can also show the embodied carbon over 
different um, where it's where it's coming from in terms of either the life cycle phase, the the um, the construction system within the building, or the material type. Um, so I think that's the end of my slides, and I would welcome any questions. Ryan, there's a question in the chat for you. Yeah, so I see there's a question: Is Carbon Cure readily available here or worth using? Um, yeah, so Carbon Cure is. And someone's saying it all counts in the in the picture. Um, Carbon Cure is uh, a system where folks at, at the concrete plant where they inject CO2 into the concrete mix. And it is um, a way to reduce the carbon of concrete. Um, it is it, it's it's it, it reduces the car carbon of concrete by um, somewhere between 5% and 10%. So it is a reduction, um, but it's definitely not a silver bullet. You know, I've heard some people say, oh, you know, we're doing carbon curse, so we don't so you know, we've got embodied carbon managed, we, we've, we've dealt with it, but it, it's it's, you know, a five to 10% reduction on your concrete only. Only. There are other things that you can do to, um, in terms of, you know, your steel supplier, your, you know, your construction processes, your wood supplier. So it's one piece to, to use to manage the embodied carbon, but it's definitely not um, the only thing to, to be thinking about. Any other um, questions? Feel free to unmute yourselves if you want to ask a question or turn your camera on. It's informal. Hi, Ryan. Hi. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I really liked it. Uh, I just had one quick question about the case study about the waterfront, which you gave where they converted from concrete to the mass timber. So I just wanted to know what was the cost impact of making that shift? Of uh, them using uh, mass timber instead of embodied yeah. instead of concrete. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure on what the difference was uh, based on just you know what I've heard through the industry in general with mass timber. It's um, I've heard there is um, there can be a slight premium in terms of the construction in, in terms of the material may cost um, a little bit more. I think I've heard from five to ten percent perhaps, but if okay. construction schedules are um, optimize the building can go up significantly faster so any additional money spent on the material can potentially be recouped by having a shorter construction schedule and start you know having rents coming in or, or um, having the finances of the projects go positive in a, in a faster time frame than would be um, required if you just use concrete so it's it's typically can cost a little bit more but it's shorter construction which can make up for that okay. Uh, and uh, like, is the amount of embodied carbon which is used in manufacturing of the elements like CLT and glulam also included uh, in the analysis? Yeah, definitely. So that's that's um, included in terms of the um, manufacturing of, of the of the mass timber. That's part of the assessment for sure. Thank you so much. There's a there's another question. How prevalent is electric construction equipment? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. It's not not very prevalent right now. Um, we are starting to see um, some. There are some sites in um, in the Nordics that are requiring this. So we've seen some leading jurisdiction that are starting to say um, they're starting to require it. But in North America, I think I've only heard of one manufacturer that's starting to develop um, con um, electric construction equipment. So it's not something that may be feasible to you know implement right now but it's something that we need to start asking for so i would recommend for example in you know in um in tender documents or something where there's a competition about you know picking the the construction team to to win the project something we could add in there is if you're able to provide low low carbon or electric construction equipment then you would get a you know higher score so this is something that we need to shift the market towards it's not something that's probably feasible to implement right now but it's something we need to start asking for asking the market for and showing there there's a demand for so that the uh, manufacturers start can deliver that um, in the future um any other questions before we sign off here well hopefully um you guys uh, found this useful and learned something um feel free to uh, reach out if you have any questions in the future and uh hope you enjoy the rest of your 
your day with the, with the conference.